Chapter Four of the Beasts of Tarzan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Christopher. The Beast of Tarzan by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter Four. Sheeta. The next few days were occupied by Tarzan in completing his weapons and exploring the jungle. He strung his bow with tendons from the buck upon which he had dined his first evening upon the new shore, and though he would have preferred the gut of Sheeta for the purpose, he was content to wait until opportunity permitted him to kill one of the great cats. He also braided a long grass rope, such a rope as he had used many years before to tantalize the ill-natured tublet, and which later had developed into a wondrous effective weapon in the practiced hands of the little ape boy. A sheath and handle for his hunting knife he fashioned, and a quiver for arrows, and from the hide of Bera a belt and loincloth. Then he set out to learn something of the strange land in which he found himself. That it was not his old familiar west coast of the African continent, he knew from the fact that it faced east. The rising sun came up out of the sea before the threshold of the jungle. But that it was not the east coast of Africa he was equally positive, for he felt satisfied that the Kincaid had not passed through the Mediterranean, the Suez Canal, and the Red Sea, nor had she had time to round the Cape of Good Hope so he was quite at a loss to know where he might be. Sometimes he wondered if the ship had crossed the broad Atlantic to deposit him upon some wild South American shore. But the presence of Numa the lion decided him that such could not be the case. As Tarzan made his lonely way through the jungle, paralleling the shore, he felt strong upon him a desire for companionship, so that gradually he commenced to regret that he had not cast his lot with the apes. He had seen nothing of them since that first day, when the influences of civilization were still paramount within him. Now he was more nearly returned to the Tarzan of old, and though he appreciated the fact that there could be little in common between himself and the great anthropoids, still they were better than no company at all. Moving leisurely, sometimes upon the ground and again among the lower branches of the trees, gathering an occasional fruit or turning over a fallen log in search of the larger bugs, which he still found as palatable as of old, Tarzan had covered a mile or more when his attention was attracted by the scent of Sheeta upwind ahead of him. Now Sheeta, the panther, was one of whom Tarzan was exceptionally glad to fall in with, for he had it in mind not only to utilize the great cat's strong gut for his bow, but also to fashion a new quiver and loincloth from pieces of his hide. So, whereas the ape-man had gone carelessly before, he now became the personification of noiseless stealth. Swiftly and silently, he glided through the forest in the wake of the savage cat. Nor was the pursuer, for all his noble birth, one whit less savage than the wild, fierce thing he stalked. As he came closer to Sheeta, he became aware that the panther on his part was stalking game of his own. And even as he realized this fact, there came to his nostrils, wafted from his right by a vagrant breeze, the strong odor of a company of great apes. The panther had taken to a large tree as Tarzan came within sight of him, and beyond and below him Tarzan saw the tribe of a cut, lolling in a little natural clearing. Some of them were dozing against the boles of trees, while others roamed about, turning over bits of bark from beneath which they transferred the luscious grubs and beetles to their mouths. A cut was the closest to Sheeta. The great cat lay crouched upon a thick limb, hidden from the ape's view by dense foliage, waiting patiently until the anthropoid should come within range of his spring. Tarzan cautiously gained a position in the same tree with the panther and a little above him. In his left hand he grasped his slim stone blade. He would have preferred to use his noose, but the foliage surrounding the huge cat precluded the possibility of an accurate throw with the rope. A cut had now wandered quite close beneath the tree wherein lay the waiting death. Sheeta slowly edged his hind paws along the branch still further beneath them, and then with a hideous shriek he launched himself toward the great ape. The barest fraction of a second before his spring, another beast of prey above him leaped, its weird and savage cry mingling with his. As the startled cut looked up, he saw the panther almost above him, and already upon the panther's back the white ape that had bested him that day near the great water. The teeth of the ape-man were buried in the back of Sheeta's neck, and his right arm was round the fierce throat, while the left hand, grasping a slender piece of stone, rose and fell in mighty blows upon the panther's side, behind the left shoulder. A cut had just time to leap to one side to avoid being pinioned beneath these battling monsters of the jungle. With a crash they came to earth at his feet. Sheeta was screaming, snarling, and roaring horribly. But the white ape clung tenaciously and in silence to the thrashing body of his quarry. 
Steadily and remorselessly, the stone knife was driven home through the glossy hide. Time and again it drank deep, until, with a final agonized lunge and shriek, the great feline rolled over upon its side, and, save for the spasmodic jerking of its muscles, lay quiet and still in death. Then the ape-man raised his head, as he stood over the carcass of his kill, and once again through the jungle rang his wild and savage victory challenge. Akut and the apes of Akut stood looking in startled wonder at the dead body of Sheeta, and the lithe, straight figure of the man who had slain him. Tarzan was the first to speak. He had saved Akut's life for a purpose, and, knowing the limitations of the ape intellect, he also knew that he must make this purpose plain to the anthropod, if it were to serve him in the way he hoped. I am Tarzan of the apes, he said. Mighty hunter, mighty fighter. By the great water I spared Akut's life when I might have taken it and become king of the tribe of Akut. Now I have saved Akut from death beneath the rending fangs of Sheeta. When Akut or the tribe of Akut is in danger, let them call to Tarzan thus, and the ape-man raised the hideous cry with which the tribe of Kerchak had been wont to summon its absent members in times of peril. And, he continued, when they hear Tarzan call to them, let them remember what he has done for Akut, and come to him with great speed. Shall it be as Tarzan says? Huh! ascended Akut and from the members of his tribe there rose a unanimous huh. Then presently they went to feeding again, as though nothing had happened, and with them fed John Clayton, Lord Greystoke. He noticed, however, that a cut kept always close to him, and was often looking at him with a strange wonder in his little bloodshot eyes. And once he did a thing that Tarzan during all his long years among the apes had never before seen an ape do. He found a particularly tender morsel, and handed it to Tarzan. As the tribe hunted, the glistening body of the ape-man mingled with the brown, shaggy hides of his companions. Oftentimes they brushed together in passing, but the apes had already taken his presence for granted, so that he was as much one of them as a cut himself. If he came too close to a she with a young baby, the former would bare her great fighting fangs and growl ominously, and occasionally a truculent young bull would snarl a warning if Tarzan approached while the former was eating. But in those things the treatment was no different from that which they accorded any other member of the tribe. Tarzan, on his part, felt very much at home with these fierce, hairy progenitors of primitive man. He skipped nimbly out of reach of each threatening female, for such is the way of apes, if they be not in one of their occasional fits of bestial rage, and he growled back at the truculent young bulls, bearing his canine teeth even as they. Thus easily he fell back into the way of his early life nor did it seem that he had ever tasted association with creatures of his own kind. For the better part of a week he roamed the jungle with his new friends, partly because of a desire for companionship, and partly through a well-laid plan to impress himself indelibly upon their memories, which at best are none too long. For Tarzan from past experience knew that it might serve him in good stead to have a tribe of these powerful and terrible beasts at his call. When he was convinced that he had succeeded to some extent in fixing his identity upon them, he decided to again take up his exploration. To this end, he set out toward the north early one day, and keeping parallel with the shore, traveled rapidly until almost nightfall. When the sun rose the next morning, he saw that it lay almost directly to his right as he stood upon the beach, instead of straight out across the water as heretofore, and so he reasoned that the shoreline had trended toward the west. All the second day he continued his rapid course, and when Tarzan of the Apes sought speed, he passed through the middle terrace of the forest with the rapidity of a squirrel. That night the sun set straight out across the water opposite the land, and then the ape-man guessed at last the truth that he had been suspecting. Rokoff had set him ashore upon an island. He might have known it. If there was any plan that would render his position more harrowing, he should have known that such would be the one adopted by the Russian, and what could be more terrible than to leave him to a lifetime of suspense upon an uninhabited island. Rokoff doubtless had sailed directly to the mainland, where it would be a comparatively easy thing for him to find the means of delivering the infant Jack into the hands of the cruel and savage foster parents, who, as his note had threatened, would have the upbringing of the child. Tarzan shuddered as he thought of the cruel suffering the little one must endure in such a life, even though he might fall into the hands of individuals whose intention towards him were of the kindest. The ape-man had had sufficient experience with the lower savages of Africa to know that even there may be found the cruder virtues of charity and humanity. But their lives were at best but a series of terrible privations, dangers, and sufferings. Then there was the horrid after-fate that awaited the child as he grew to manhood. 
the horrible practices that would form a part of his life training would alone be sufficient to bar him forever from association with those of his own race and station in life. A cannibal, his little boy a savage man-eater, it was too horrible to contemplate. The filed teeth, the slit nose, the little face painted hideously, Tarzan groaned. Could he but feel the throat of the rust fiend beneath his steel fingers? And Jane! What tortures of doubt and fear and uncertainty she must be suffering! He felt that his position was infinitely less terrible than hers, for at least he knew that one of his loved ones was safe at home, while she had no idea of the whereabouts of either her husband or her son. It is well for Tarzan that he did not guess the truth, for the knowledge would have but added a hundredfold to his suffering. As he moved slowly through the jungle, his mind absorbed by his gloomy thoughts, there presently came to his ears a strange scratching sound which he could not translate. Cautiously he moved in the direction from which it emanated, presently coming upon a huge panther pinned beneath the fallen tree. As Tarzan approached, the beast turned snarling towards him, struggling to extricate itself, but one great limb across its back and the smaller entangling branches pinging its legs prevented it from moving but a few inches in any direction. The ape-man stood before the helpless cat, fitting an arrow to his bow that he might dispatch the beast that otherwise must die of starvation. But even as he drew back the shaft, a sudden whim stayed his hand. Why rob the poor creature of life and liberty, when it would be so easy a thing to restore both to it? He was sure from the fact that the panther moved all its limbs in its futile struggle for freedom that its spine was uninjured, and for the same reason he knew that none of its limbs were broken. Relaxing his bowstring, he returned the arrow to the quiver, and throwing the bow about his shoulder, stepped closer to the pinion beast. On his lips was the soothing purring sound that the great cats themselves made when contented and happy. It was the nearest approach to a friendly advance that Tarzan could make in the language of Sheeta. The panther ceased its snarling and eyed the ape-man closely. To lift the tree's great weight from the animal it was necessary to come within reach of those long, strong talons, and when the tree had been removed the man would be totally at the mercy of the savage beast. But to Tarzan of the apes fear was a thing unknown. Having decided, he acted promptly. Unhesitatingly, he stepped into the tangle of branches close to the panther's side, still voicing his friendly and conciliatory purr. The cat turned his head towards the man, eyeing him steadily, questioningly. The long fangs were bared, but more in preparedness than threat. Tarzan put a broad shoulder beneath the bowl of the tree, and as he did so his bare leg pressed against the cat's silken side. So close was the man to the great beast. Slowly Tarzan extended his giant thews. The great tree, with its entangling branches, rose gradually from the panther, who, feeling the encumbering weight diminish, quickly crawled from beneath. Tarzan let the tree fall back to earth, and the two beasts turned to look upon one another. A grim smile lay upon the ape-man's lips, for he knew that he had taken his life in his hands to free this savage jungle fellow, nor would it have surprised him had the cat sprung upon him the instant that it had been released. But it did not do so. Instead, it stood a few paces from the tree, watching the ape-man clamber out of the maze of fallen branches. Once outside, Tarzan was not three paces from the panther. He might have taken to the higher branches of the trees upon the opposite side, for Sheeta cannot climb to the heights to which the ape-man can go. But something, a spirit of bravado perhaps, prompted him to approach the panther as though to discover if any feeling of gratitude would prompt the beast to friendliness. As he approached the mighty cat, the creature stepped warily to one side, and the ape-man brushed past him within a foot of the dripping jaws. And as he continued on through the forest, the panther followed on behind him as a hound follows at heel. For a long time Tarzan could not tell whether the beast was following out of friendly feelings or merely stalking him against the time he should be hungry. But finally he was forced to believe that the former incentive it was that prompted the animal's action. Later in the day the scent of a deer sent Tarzan into the trees and when he had dropped his noose about the animal's neck, he called to Sheeta, using a purr similar to that which he had utilized to pacify the brute's suspicions earlier in the day, but a trifle louder and more shrill. It was similar to that which he had heard panthers used after a kill when they had been hunting in pairs. Almost immediately there was a crashing of the underbrush close at hand, and the long, lithe body of his strange companion broke into view. At sight of the body of Bara and the smell of blood, the panther gave forth a shrill scream, and a moment later two beasts were feeding side by side upon the tender meat of the deer. For several days this strangely assorted pair roamed the jungle together. When one made a kill, he called the other, and thus they fed well and often. On one occasion, 
as they were dining upon the carcass of a boar that Sheeta had dispatched. Numa, the lion, grim and terrible, broke through the tangled grasses close beside them. With an angry, warning roar, he sprang forward to chase them from their kill. Sheeta bounded into a nearby thicket, while Tarzan took to the low branches of an overhanging tree. Here the ape-man unloosed his grass rope from about his neck, and as Numa stood above the body of the boar, challenging head erect, he dropped the sinuous noose about the main neck, drawing the stout strands taut with a sudden jerk. At the same time he called shrilly to Sheeta, as he drew the struggling lion upward until only his hind feet touched the ground. Quickly he made the rope fast to a stout branch, and as the panther, in answer to his summons, leaped into sight, Tarzan dropped to the earth beside the struggling and infuriated Numa, and with a long sharp knife sprang upon him at one side even as Sheeta did upon the other. The panther tore and rent Numa upon the right, while the ape-man struck home with his stone knife upon the other, so that before the mighty clawing king of beasts had succeeded in parting the rope he hung quite dead and harmless in the noose. And then upon the jungle air there rose in unison from two savage throats the victory cry of the bull-ape and the panther, blended into one frightful and uncanny scream. As the last notes died away in a long-drawn, fearsome wail, a score of painted warriors, drawing their long war-canoe upon the beach, halted to stare in the direction of the jungle, and to listen. End of chapter 4